Thanks, guys. Always a pleasure to be here at Key Code. The first thing that I'm going to show you is the new color management inside of Adobe Premiere. And this is something that starts by the moment we start bringing footage into Premiere. Premiere is now recognizing and automatically detecting more log formats, more raw formats than ever before. And we're applying an automatic transform to the footage to make the color look good right out of the gate. I can still take a clip and load it up in the source monitor if I want to see that original log footage, but directly in the timeline, I'm now seeing really, really nice color right out of the gate. And this is true for just about any type of camera, Sony, Canon, uh, Fuji, RED, um, you name it, we are supporting these different types of log formats. and. Uh, this also ties in with something that we've done with our general color setup. In the past, Premiere worked in specific modes where you would edit in a 709 mode or you would edit in an HLG mode. Uh, this is something that's found under the sequence settings under this new color management tab. And we still have those direct modes that we've had in the past. But one of the cool things that we've now added is a new wide color gamut mode. And this is looking like it's going to be the default for people moving forward because this provides just a larger playground to play with color. It means that more of the dynamic range of those log clips is available inside of Premiere Pro to push and pull and twist the color to your liking. I'm going to leave this in Direct 709 mode for just a moment here. We'll go ahead and click OK, just because I want to show kind of the, the default. And these modes are in there for backwards compatibility. If you have an older project, you bring it into the new color management, it should look the same. And the way these sliders will work is still going to be the same. So if I have this, uh, this particular clip selected here in the sequence, I come in here and I use this exposure control. You can see it kind of uniformly brings things down, but the skin starts to look a bit kind of washed out the further I bring the exposure down on this clip. Let's go ahead and go to settings, and I'm gonna switch this color setup to wide gamut. Now under the hood, this is actually using something called ACES CCT. It's a small part of an overall ACES color workflow. It's a known commodity for working in this wide color gamut space. So we're not instituting full-blown ACES in Premiere just yet, but uh, this gives us that wide color gamut to work with. And if you look here, just the look of the footage as I move the same slider in this wide color gamut space, you can see how it's preserving the brightness of uh, the woman's arm in the shot, the highlights on the windowsill here uh, as we're moving this around. So we're super, super excited to work with this. There's a number of different effects inside of Premiere that are color space aware and will automatically work with this. And you still have all the flexibility to use the format that you're looking for. If you're looking for uh, doing things with LUTs, if you prefer LUTs for some reason, you can kind of mix and match depending on the formats that you're working with in the timeline. It's designed to make color management super, super simple. You just flip it over to wide gamut, set it and forget it, and you don't have to worry about it. So we're super excited about some updates coming with Firefly for video. So Firefly for still images has been out for a while, but the new hotness is Firefly for video. And we're super, super excited about bringing this to a larger audience with beta. Uh, what I'm showing right now is just some examples. These are actual clips that were generated using the new Firefly for video beta. Uh, this shows some of the additional controls that are available dealing with setting up camera motion from various various buttons, but the whole idea of being able to type into a text prop and generate clips is something that we're super, super excited about. Whether these are for kind of a pre-visualization, uh, whether you're trying to build out elements that you're going to use in something like Adobe After Effects, or even playing around with motion graphic styles. And it's also possible to use a reference image as part of your prompt. So if you have a particular picture that you want to start from, you can actually do that. We're also super excited about Generative Extend. This will be the first new feature dealing with Gen AI imagery directly inside of Adobe Premiere. And the idea behind this is 
uh, generative extend will allow you to take any clip on the timeline, wherever you've decided your trim point is, you can actually extend up to two seconds beyond that in order to just maybe hold on a beat before you cut or dissolve to something different. Um, this also includes audio. So if you're just looking for extending out some room tone, it's a fantastic tool for using that as well. So performance is something that I could just kind of touch on and talk about here. It's difficult to set something up to showcase for this, but uh, basically the team of engineers has been hard at work on trying to make exports faster, uh, make sure that you have great performance. Everything with color that I was showing, those are all native clips that are in you know 4K, 5K, 6K, 8K uh, in size, editing direct inside of the Premiere Pro sequence. So we've always had really good performance with that. We now have better performance uh, with more formats, and we've improved on our export for ProRes, uh, speeding it up in some cases to up to three times faster. So as you're exporting out your files, you're just seeing a big improvement in how quickly we can get your exports done. One new feature that we're actually looking at, we're super excited about, is the new properties panel inside of Premiere. Now, a little bit of uh, background on this. If you go looking for the essential graphics panel, you're not going to find it. It's now replaced by the properties panel. But the properties panel is it's everything that you could do with the essential graphics panel as far as controlling and moving properties of your text and, and graphics. But now this also works on video clips, audio clips, pretty much anything in your timeline can now be adjusted and modified using the properties panel. So if I have a particular set of, you know, some B-roll footage uh, in the timeline here, and I need to make a modification to this. And this is the other thing that's great about the properties panel. If I select multiple clips, I can actually come in here, for example, let me just jump to this. Maybe we want to give the end of this more of a uh, widescreen, a little bit of a matted look. You'll notice that I'm doing this across uh, all these different clips. This is happening with one adjustment on multiple clips at the same time. So the properties panel becomes kind of that one-stop shop. As we've grown Premiere, we've actually added all these different essential panels in different places for adjusting and making modifications to, uh, to these different uh, values here. And we wanted to just have that one-stop shop where you can just know, go to properties. If you don't find what you're looking for here, up in the upper corner, there's a little three-dot menu here that reveals advanced effect controls, color controls, uh, browsing your effects and transitions, browsing graphics and templates, and browsing Adobe Stock Audio. Which, oh, a little bonus thing here, we actually shipped over 15,000 sound effects are now included in Adobe Stock uh, for free. You can actually go in and you can browse and work with these sound effects uh, directly from the Essential Sound panel. But with properties, this just becomes that one stop, that one location that you can go in, uh, find the controls you're looking for. If you don't see the advanced options, you know where to go. Uh, by clicking on the three dots, you can quickly find what you're looking for. And that's the whole goal of properties, is just getting people to the right controls at the right time. Well, let me dive into some of the audio workflow stuff that we've been working on. And the first thing I, of course, want to showcase is enhanced speech, because this has just been a, uh, a game changer for the way that Premiere operates. Now, to do this, I'm just going to select all of these clips here. And I don't see my control in properties, but I know exactly where to get to that. I can go into open more audio controls, and here is the essential sound panel. Here's my enhanced speech. I'll go ahead and turn that on for these clips here so that you can see uh, I've got those now set up. Basically, what enhanced speech is doing is it's listening to the audio down to the sample level, and it's trying to, to recognize a human speech. It goes through and analyzes individual sounds that uh, a human being may make as part of speech, and it rebuilds the waveform 
uh, of just that speech in a clean environment. So rather than the usual way of taking audio and kind of trying to carve these frequencies out to get rid of the fountain in the background and carve out the echo uh, with different plugins and things like this, this is just taking the idea of let's detect what, what phonemes are being used in human speech and just rebuild those into a fresh new waveform. The controls for these are actually set up in such a way that if I go through and I select all of these again, there is actually a mix slider in here that lets me kind of blend in some of the original so that it doesn't sound too sterile. That can actually be a problem with this, is that the uh, generated audio can be uh, a little bit too sterile. So I've got an example here. I'm gonna go ahead and select all the clips in my timeline here. I'm just gonna start playing this back and I'm gonna toggle on the original audio. I'll do that right now. And I'll play a little of this and then I'll toggle to the enhanced speech version so that you can compare and contrast the difference between these two. All right, go ahead and hit play. My name is Lauren Yes. I'm a muralist. I've been a muralist for 10 years. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and I was always drawing and painting, always getting in trouble for doodling in my math workbook, for example. Uh, I was always a fan of street art. Uh, I'd never seen anyone doing a mural before, but I always loved large-scale work and thought it was the coolest thing on the planet. And when I graduated from college, I was just wandering around San Francisco and saw some Lucani mural and a big blue wish, and I was just like, I, I have to do that. I didn't know. So what you can see there is just the difference between the two. Um, you know, it's definitely one of those things that it's an amazing tool in your toolbox, particularly if you've got audio recorded in an uncontrolled environment where you just got that, you know, trying to get a microphone that's 10, 15 feet away to sound like a lavalier is kind of been the holy grail for a while. This can do it in certain circumstances. It's a, a pretty amazing tool. And at, at any point you're not liking a particular segment and how enhanced speech is working with it, you can play with this slider and actually dial in and go back to some of the original uh, and some of the generated audio. So fantastic tool here. This is just part of what we've done dealing with uh, different audio workflows. If I go back to that main sequence that I was working with here, we've added a number of different controls as far as being able to adjust uh, fade in and fade out controls directly on the timeline here. We have a little control box here that I can just pull out a fade in or a fade out and I can adjust the exact sine wave, what the cosine value of the curve here to get the exact type of fade in that I'm looking for. There's so much more I could show you dealing with audio. Um, we've gone through and kind of revamped a lot of the way audio is displayed. We're automatically detecting the type of audio so that you don't have to select clips and say, these are dialogue, these are music. Premiere does it automatically. And we've added new badge controls in here so that if you're looking for the controls for something like auto ducking, something that would affect music, you can literally just click this little button and it takes you right to those controls for you. So a lot of extra work done, just kind of improving, making it easier to discover things dealing with audio directly in the Premiere Pro timeline. There's a little tiny new feature that actually showed up in 24.6. It's in the shipping version of Premiere, and I'm actually super excited about it, even though it's dealing with a technology that's like decades old. Um, we thought linear time code was kind of a dead technology, but with the rise of all these small cameras and inexpensive tools for actually adding linear time code to things like you know GoPro style cameras and the like, uh, we're starting to see a resurgence in the need for support for LTC, for linear time code. This is time code recorded on an audio track. And we've actually added that into Premiere now where we can actually recognize uh, clips that have linear time codes. So if I come in here to one of these clips, I'll just right click on it and go to modify, go to time code. You'll see that there is a new option in here. It sounds strange thinking about linear time code as a new feature, but uh, yeah, this is something as we've seen the rise of people doing multicams with like 20, 30, 40 cameras covering a live event. And especially as you're adding in these cheaper, more inexpensive cameras that don't support a time code track natively, it's a really, really valuable thing to have. And I'm super excited that the team listened to the editors on our forums and said, you know what? We gotta go back and, and support that again. So here it is.